Hello, welcome to another edition of Convict Inc. I'm your host, Robert Rosso. If you have not subscribed to this channel, please do so. And if you like this video, please like it. As for sharing, I am asking everybody in this audience, anybody that's watching this video, if you know somebody in McCarthy, Alaska, if you know somebody who visited, if you know somebody... Um, that watches the edge of Alaska, please make sure they see this video because you guys will get it here in just a second. First of all, McCarthy, Alaska. Well, if you've ever seen the, the Discovery series, Edge of Alaska, that's the town of McCarthy. So from 1900 to 1938, McCarthy was um, basically a booming recreation area for uh, the adjacent town of uh, Kencott, I believe it is. Oh, I wrote this terrible. Kennecott, which was um, a mining town. So if you're a miner and you want to have a good time, McCarthy was the place to go. After 1990, after 1938, when everything shut down, there was only a few families that remained in that area, that is, of McCarthy. And if you, if nobody's seen McCarthy, please go look at it. This, this is a beautiful place. I think it's been exploited. I think it's now a lot of big hotel and all this other stuff, but hey, um, it's 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 just a beautiful, beautiful area. As somebody who loves the mountains, I get why people would want to stay there and live remotely like they did back in the past. There's probably still a lot of remote areas up there, I'm sure. Awesome, just an awesome place. There was a computer programmer by the name of Louis D. Hastings from California who was an unemployed computer programmer who moved up to Alaska, lived up in Anchorage with his wife, had a summer place in McCarthy, I believe, and decided that he wanted to live in McCarthy. Now, Louis Lou was a complete environmentalist whack job. There's a pipeline running through McCarthy and he wanted to shut it down. But instead of just blowing it up or whatever he was going to do, he decided at first he had to kill everybody that lived in the town of McCarthy. So one day he sat off, had coffee with a friend, shot him in the face or the head, and commenced to going to shoot other people. In all, six people died, which was like half the town at the time. I think there was like eight people. I don't remember, but there was very few people in this town. Uh, six people died and so many others were wounded. There's a, you can do a Google check on it and it talks about it. Uh, Louis, he was ultimately arrested, sentenced to over 500 years, and he was placed inside the federal system. Although he was a state inmate, he was placed inside the Federal Bureau of Prisons. In 1998, I was sentenced to life without parole and I was sent to the United States Penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas. Uh, I was placed in a housing unit or the cell block B lower, cell 250. And my neighbor, a few cells down, was none other than this Lou Hastings character. Lou is was a weird, weird guy. A lot of weird people in prison. This guy had already been down since the 80s, so he'd been down over 15 years. Didn't talk to people, gave very few people the time of day, time of day. Um, ha had no conversation for anybody. What he did was he built himself a war, his own little world within the prison. That is, Lou was the head or general maintenance man for the kitchen. Handy guy, fix refrigerator, stove, whatever, you name it, he can fix it. And he did not like other people working with him. He liked to work by himself. Under the chow hall, that is, if you walk into the chow hall at Leavenworth, off to the right, you've got all the, you got the lines where the line servers are. To the back over here, there's a door. You go through the door. That's where the cook, every, all the cooking area is. You got the dish satellite area. You had the office space, which was straight ahead. You had the, the administrator's office, which was above. And then you had an elevator. That elevator went under the prison. And that's where Lou Hastings lived. From the time the doors racked until the time he had to go in, he lived in that kitchen under there. He had a couch. He had chairs. He had a, a love seat. He had just, he was totally set up. He had his own typewriters. He had his, um, that's where he hung out. He had his own little apartment 
actually it was like it was more like a mansion down there under the kitchen it's just warehouse after warehouse after warehouse so he was going about his business doing just fine enter eddie cox and his protege rusty eddie cox is a famous jailhouse lawyer there's no person that's won more cases than eddie cox i do not believe in the federal bureau of prisons as an inmate as a jailhouse lawyer his protege was a guy that i'll say rusty i won't say his last name i didn't get permission eddie was the head kitchen clerk and he took rusty made him his second clerk and they would do all the kitchen business that they had to all the they kept track of everything uh you know food everything a kitchen clerk is supposed to do but they did that within minutes. They spent their day in an office doing legal briefs. They did legal work. One day, it was determined that they could not be in that office anymore, or at least both of them. Rusty ended up finding a place under the kitchen in Lou Hastings' territory. Now, I paid Rusty over five or about five thousand dollars to do my twenty two fifty five. If you do not know what a twenty two fifty five is, it's like a just consider it a second and final ish appeal. There, there's more than that, but um, just that's the best way to put that. Rusty was had typed my appeal or twenty two fifty five on a typewriter with memory, and then he got locked up for a methamphetamine investigation. Um, that is, people were sending meth on greeting cards, meth that had been liquid, you know, uh, put in liquid form, took meth, put acetone water on it or whatever, and then put in the greeting cards on the corner, about a gram a card. He got uh, put in the hole for about 90 days. During that time, my time limit was running out. You have one year to file a 2255 plus 90 days, but let's just say one year. And my time was running out. So when Rusty got out of the hole, I'm like, hey, what's going on? What are we doing here? You know, and he's like, I got it. He goes downstairs to get his typewriter and Lou Hastings had moved it. Rusty confronted Lou and said, hey, where's his typewriter? He said, it's gone. He says, uh, that's a problem. You know, I, I need to at least print something off that memory. And Lou said, not happening. Rusty then approaches me and said, hey, here's the situation. What do we do? Uh, he said he, that he believed he knew where the typewriter was, but this is what was going on. I said, what do we do? He's hit. I'll pay the contract. I was not a member of the Dirty White Boys yet, although I was associate, but that wasn't Dirty White Boy business. This was something separate and independent. This guy had my life in his hands. This guy knew where that typewriter was. So I wanted the typewriter. I wanted it copy. I wanted my brief. And then I wanted this man hit paid for the contract rusty goes and finds a typewriter actually gets a member gets the brief just like we knew he would and then the contract came the contract was not murder it was an assault so i want to be clear about that so i paid rusty rusty then contracts a guy by the name of tony i'm not going to say tony's last name but i will be doing something about him in the future tony became the leader of the Aryan Resistance Militia in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. So a lot of you guys who know the feds know what I'm talking about. TA. So I'll just say that. But Tony, I like the hell, I like Tony a lot. Tony then, he didn't want his hands dirty either. Probably gave the, another person, so it was $500 in the beginning. Probably gave somebody $100. Uh, he was a real influential guy. Um, uh, power, persuasion, just un, unbelievable. So... One day, didn't even know it was coming. Uh, again, Lou Hastings lived a few cells down from me. At the, actually, at the time, I was living in a different cell, but he lived up in 256, 258. I keep scratching, by the way. This table is, uh, I, I realize, it's causing me to scratch more than, I got little welts on my arms. <laughs> anyway, my bad. Um, let me put something down. So Lou Hastings uh, is sitting in a cell. It's right before, so it's after three o'clock. Every day at three o'clock, all the inmates are recalled for count time. Actually, you have to be in by 3.30, but like the workforce is called in at three o'clock. Unicor, kitchen workers, whatever. Lou goes in his cell, is reading his newspaper, and his door opens. Now, let me say this. In Leavenworth, 
The doors swing open uh, and be lower and be upper. The doors open. If you shut that door, it clicks and you have to get an officer to open it. So everybody puts a little magnet or something that'll block the door so it can't go closed all the way. Uh, officers don't like it, but they'd really rather have you do that than have than than uh, have need to be called to your cell every time you need to get in and out. That's a pain in the ass. So Lou's sitting on his bed reading. A young white guy walks in, and under his shirt is a steel pipe. Lou looks up, said, "Who are you?" Guy walks in, says, "Don't worry about it." Shuts the door. When he shuts the door. He didn't know it, but he locked himself in. Lou had a domino with a magnet. The domino fell. Now he's locked in the dude's cell. Takes out the pipe and commences to beating the living hell out of Lou Hastings. He was screaming. The guy made him shut up. He was screaming so loud and then kept beating on him. <laughs> when the guy turned to leave, he was locked in. The way that the officers found out that Lou Hastings had been assaulted was dr blood was dripping out into the floor, out of un from underneath the cell door out. That's how bad this guy got beat. So, the comp I talked to the guy who did. Let's just call it M. M was the assailant. I talked to him later in the hole, and he said that he beat Lou, and he said why, and he said I don't know, I don't fuck, I don't know, <laughs> beat him with the pipe. And after he beat him, so he didn't want to kill him, they sit down and Lou's talking to him. And he's like, yeah, you, you beat me pretty good. He's like, man. And then and then he's like, he started to panic. And then he started like getting ready to scream and scream. And the guy said, if you scream, I'm going to beat you to death. And Lou shut up. So actually, and when the door opened, yeah, Lou told him, hey, see you later, man. <laughs> it's so crazy. Hey, th thanks for the meeting, bro. See you later. Uh, there was a lot of laughs about that, but Lou Hastings, environmental wacko, got hit, got pummeled because of me. So he was taken to the hole and he was never put back in general population again. And that was probably the most damaging thing to him. This guy wanted back on our general population. Trust me. This man had it made. There's there's, there's usually a handful of inmates in every prison that have it made. Guys that have done time know what I'm talking about. This guy had it made. If you have your own little apartment in the prison, you get officer's food. You don't need inmate food. You can get anything in the warehouse you want. He was downstairs in the warehouse with all the, the, all the merch, everything, anything he wanted. All came crashing down over a damn typewriter. Lost it. But um, what this guy did, uh, not mad. So shout out to McCarthy, Alaska. Any of the victims of Lou Hastings and family members, you're welcome. <laughs>